evening. Let me make sure that I am in frame. Good evening, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Happy hump day. It's a short week, so I hope you guys are just as excited and motivated by that information as I am. My name is Razia Cooper, and I am the engagement coordinator for the NASW New Jersey and Delaware chapter. And one of my roles here is to provide amazing, unique programming to support our social work profession and our emerging professionals and our social work students. So I'm super excited today that we are going to be talking about military social work and how social workers can provide services for those who serve. If you have been around a little bit of time, you know that I am also a military spouse. So this is a, a, a topic <laughs> or a presentation that is near and dear to my own personal heart. So I'm happy that we can embark on this journey together tonight, especially so close to Veterans Day. It was perfect timing for us to talk and explore this topic. Before we jump into tonight's presentation, I just wanna thank you guys for registering and for showing up on time and for just being prepared to learn. When you register for any program with the NASW New Jersey chapter, there is a code of conduct thing that you click when you submitted your res re registration. And it simply just says that you are going to respect our facilitator and your fellow participants. So we are going to be monitoring the chats, making sure that we're saying nice things and we're being kind, kind to each other on tonight and respecting our host. I am excited that we have the opportunity just to have Dr. Um, Tanisha Graves with us tonight because she is going to bring so much knowledge to the forefront. She has been a service member herself and she now works with service members. So I think we are just going to jump in. I'm going to read her bio before I hand it over to her. So Dr. Tanisha J. J. Graves is a board certified and a licensed clinical social worker with the Department of Veterans Affair, Affairs. As a behavioral health access coordinator, Dr. Graves is solely responsible for veteran engagement in behavioral health services for one VA medical center and six VA outpatient clinics, serving over 17,000 veterans in Texas and New Mexico. Dr. Graves aids in helping veterans, family members, and caregivers locate and obtain local, regional, and national resources for disabled veterans to include enrollment for medical, mental health, and financial benefits. Dr. Graves also provides biweekly high-risk and case consultation for two veteran centers in the West Texas region by collaborating in the performance improvement process for compliance measures. She's in charge of same-day access for crisis evaluation, management, and care coordination across all seven VA sites. She contributes to building community relationships by providing bi-monthly outreach events and community education regarding the VA and suicide prevention program to various organizations in Southwest Texas. Dr. Graves graduated from Fearful High in 2000, received her Bachelor of Science degree in psychology from Alabama State University in 2005, and a Master's of Social Work degree from the University of Southern California with a focus in military social work in 2013, and her Doctor of Social Work degree with a focus of clinical expertise from Walden University in 2020. She also serves as a contributing faculty member for Walden University's Bachelor of Social Work program and has provided mentorship for over 50 social work interns. With over 18 years of mental health field experience, her background includes suicide prevention, crisis intervention, psychoeducational groups, psychoeducational groups, couple communication courses, substance abuse treatment, and prevention, acute inpatient psychiatry, community outreach, child, adolescent, and adult in, and individual and group counseling and housing assistant for homeless veterans. Dr. Graves is also a veteran and served eight years in the United States Air Force as a mental health technician, where she earned a non-commissioned officer of the year award in addition to an angel award for completing the most volunteer hours among active duty personnel. Dr. Graves serves the NASW Rising Star Award 
received the NASW Rising Star Award from the National Association of Social Workers, Nevada chapter. Dr. Grave is also a proud member of the following community service organizations, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the National Association of Social Workers, Texas chapter, Network for Social Work Management, National Association of Black Social Workers, Houston Association of Black Social Workers chapter, Alabama State University National Alumni Association, Houston chapter, Houston HBCU Alumni Association, and the Houston Area Urban League. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanisha, for just being here with us tonight. And again, thank you again for your service to our country. And I hope that you enjoy your Veterans Day and you can take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. yes. Every, okay. I'm working off of three monitors. So if it looks like I'm looking somewhere else, I just have notes on different screens. But uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you guys again for having me here. I'm super excited. I love talking about military social work um, and also um, sharing my experience. Um, as you heard in my bio, I am um, a veteran from the United States Air Force. I served eight years. Uh, and in my role while I was active duty, I worked in mental health um, to include the outpatient clinic, inpatient clinic, uh, the family advocacy clinic, and the substance abuse clinic. And, and I'll get into a little bit more of what those roles entail uh, throughout the presentation. Um, a lot of the information that I'm going to share with you all is based on my experience when I was in um, the military and some of the roles that I fulfilled. Um, she touched on a little bit of what I do now with the Department of Veteran Affairs. I've been with the uh, VA for about seven years now, uh, and I've held a couple different roles from suicide prevention to some um, intensive case management um, with some veterans. I've also done uh, like the community outreach component and some housing uh, assistance working with homeless veterans. So I always like to say, oh my gosh, I feel like I've done a little bit of everything uh, over the past 18 years of me being in mental health. So um, if at any time during the presentation, it's super informal. So if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat. Um, I'm looking at my main screen, so I won't be able to see them, but just grab my attention and then I'll get your question. I don't mind at all. Cool. Okay, let me go ahead and get started. Okay, um, this just goes over a little bit of my bio. One of the most important things, of course, uh, is my email address and phone number listed there on the screen. Uh, you are more than welcome to use me as a resource if you have any questions um, regarding anything related to military social work or the Department of Veteran Affairs. I know a lot of times when I'm meeting with students and other social workers, they have interest in uh, working with veterans and families, um, but they're not really sure how to kind of get into it. Um, so I am more than happy to talk with anyone, email anyone that has any questions. I um, completely enjoy that for sure. And another uh, award that I just received uh, was recognized by my undergraduate university as a 50 under 50 uh, alumni winner. So I was pretty excited about that. I just got that one at the beginning of October. So that's another one I can add to my uh, achievements and awards. Um, I also this summer did recently complete um, my clinical supervision training. So I am allowed to provide clinical supervision um, in the state of Texas to those who are trying to pursue a clinical social work uh, licensure. Okay, so the learning objectives for today, we're gonna talk about what is military social work? What does that look like? Um, there are a variety of roles that social workers can play within the military community, whether that be active duty or uh, with veterans and their families as well. I will also talk um, how to become a military social worker, and then we'll go over some military social work resources as well. And then at the end, I uh, built in some time for just some questions and answers, um, any dialogue or 
or anything like that. Okay. Also, I'm getting over my third sinus infection. So if my voice starts to get a little crazy or if I start coughing, just bear with me. Okay, let me get my notes up. Give me one second. Okay, so when we talk about military social work, um, social workers can serve in a variety of ways, whether that be on active duty Air Force bases. I'm, I'm a little biased, so I'm, if I mention the Air Force a lot, it's just because I, it's, it's a habit. So whether that be active duty bases, and that's traditionally where you have your service men and women who um, are assigned to an active duty base, that's where they work, that's their job, they fulfill all of their duties, they're on base um, on a full-time basis. And then when we talk about guard and reserves, um, you know, it just depends on what the service commitment is. For example, uh, there can be a full-time National Guard or you can be a part-time National Guard. So it really just depends. And a lot of times, you know, it is um, based on if there is a national emergency going on, um, if there's extra deployment needs, um, then they can call up a guard or reserve base to assist those active duty members as well. Now, when we talk about the reserve component, um, the reserves are basically where you can do part-time military work as far as like trainings and you know certifications and staying current it's almost like a we're going to keep keep you ready just in case we need you but we also want you to focus on your civilian career as well um and a lot of times or most times uh with your employment there is that clause built in that hey if i get caught up on my guard or reserve duty then you know my job should be protected here and i can go serve my country, serve my time on orders, and then come return back to work. And, and then uh, that's that. So as a social worker working with military services, you know, the goal is to improve the mental well-being of our active duty members, the guard, the reserve, and not only them, but their families as well. And there are so many different ways that social workers connect with service members and their families on not only on base, um, but in deployed locations. And then also um, when they separate, retire um, in the transition to the veteran side, uh, which I'll touch on some veteran things as well. Okay. Okay, and I got this little blurb from uh, the social work careers related to military social work website. Uh, military social workers enjoy an ex excellent employment outlook thanks to all the overall growth in the profession. Um, there is a huge need for social workers um, who can do what we do and also you know, help take on a lot of different roles within the military and also um, the veteran side as well. So a lot of the things that encompass our role relate to military family counseling. And that's not only with just the service member, that includes the, their spouse um, and their children as well. A lot of times we um, help with the military, preparing them to transition to back to civilian life. Uh, for example, when it was time for me to make a decision on whether or not I was going to separate from the Air Force or continue to stay, um, there is a course that they send you to, um, I, I can't remember the name, but it's something like a transitional course where they talk to you about uh, the benefits and perks of staying active duty versus what you can kind of expect when it's time for you to transition into civilian life. And then it kind of gives you, they used to call it a, uh, Rebluing us because you know the Air Force is blue, so they'll say, Okay, this is our time to reblue you and try to get you back in the mindset of maybe I should stay in another four years. And some people are like, Huh, once you weigh out the pros and cons, then they make a decision to stay in. Um, and some people are like, Nah, I'm, I'm ready, <laughs> I'm ready to get out. Uh, and then also, crisis intervention is, is a big uh role within um within the military social work field also. And that can be 
in-person crisis intervention. Uh, for example, um, like I mentioned, I was a mental health technician, so I worked in the mental health clinic. And one of our roles at the time was to provide crisis intervention um, on site. Uh, so say, for example, if, if someone uh, passed away on base, um, say, for example, it was a car accident. So uh, someone from mental health, someone from the chaplain's office, uh, someone from the um, family resource office, someone from that member's unit, uh, we all get together to see what needs will be for the family, um, you know, providing that layer of support support that crisis intervention to help them kind of um, assist with anything that may be going on. Uh, it, it's hard to kind of process a lot of different things uh, logically in a crisis at the moment. So we have the team collectively come together to figure out how we can best serve the family member or that service member in their, in their time of need. Okay, now getting into some of the roles that social workers play. And this is just some of the roles. Uh, one of the things, um, so quick story. Uh, when I joined the military, it was 2006. And then I separated in 2013. So when I was in the military, um, we didn't have the, the first program I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about is the True North program. Uh, we didn't have that program when I was and so when I started to kind of research what some changes are that uh, happened since I separated, I was very excited to, to read about the program and just see that there are different things that they have kind of set in place to, to make sure the needs are getting met. Now, the True North program is a resiliency program, um, and that is where the military embeds um, providers like social workers or chaplains. Um, things like that, and they assign them to an actual unit as compared to um, just having a separate mental health outpatient clinic that people can come to. Now you have a space where, hey, there is an actual mental health professional in my actual uh, unit, in my office, um, so I don't have to um, leave work in a sense and go over to the mental health clinic and set an appointment and, you know, um, in that manner, I can just go to the person that's kind of assigned to our unit. And those social, so, excuse me, those social workers, you know, will know the ins and outs of your program because they're attached to your unit. So a lot of times people will feel more comfortable talking to them because they understand what's going on in their unit, in their, um, in their area. Now, uh, we all know there's a huge stigma related to seeking mental health treatment. And it's, it's extremely huge in the military as well. Um, when I was working in the clinic, you know, on military uniforms, your last name is showing. Um, and, you know, people kind of recognize you when you're in uniform. So a lot of times service members would change out of their uniform and just put on some regular um, low profile clothing, put on a ball cap or something like that and come to the clinic. So it would ease some of their stress and ambivalence about coming to the actual mental health clinic um, with that stigma. So the, I know the military works very hard and diligently to try to uh, minimize some of that stigma. Um, so the True Enough program is, I thought it was a great um, idea for them to have them embedded in the actual um, units. So that's a, that was a great benefit that I read about. Now, uh, military family life consultants, this is another great role. I, I thought it was um, a really good role. So they did have these at the time when I was active duty and we would make referrals to them a lot, um, just based on that stigma again. Now, a lot of um, service members were just dealing with typical life stressors. How do I balance? you know, work? How do I balance school? How do I balance just transitioning? I'm here um, on my own, you know, not having that social support. Um, you know, you think about an 18-year-old that's left home. Um, now they live on the other side of the country. They don't really know anybody. You know, that could be a difficult situation to maneuver through. So the family, the family life consultants, um, I'll give you an example. So say, for example, 
uh, you're, you're assigned to a base for four to six months as a family life consultant. So it's kind of like um, you're not active duty. You're just a civilian person that's assigned to that base and you're just another outside resource that they can use. So say, and they provide a uh, brief kind of like solution focused therapy. Um, so say for example, you get eight sessions. So they, they can meet you um, anywhere that's comfortable for you, except, you know, your house, their car uh, or their house or something like that. But say, for example, if you went to meet with them, you know, at a Starbucks or a library or at the park or something uh, to that effect, then you have that one-on-one -on -one engagement with a, a mental health professional and you're able to just talk about whatever that's bothering you. Um, when I was active duty, the, the military family life consultants, they didn't have to chart. They didn't have to take notes. It was literally just like a, if you think about it, I need a vent partner. I need someone that I can just kind of talk to, get some things off my chest. Um, the only stipulations was, of course, if they presented um, with self-harm or harm to others, then the, the family life consultants do have to report that. Other than that, um, a lot of things, you know, that they, they would address is just related to normal everyday life stressors. Um, a lot of times people find difficulties in, in trying to find that balance in everything. So they were a great resource. Um, that way you could say, I'm going to a medical appointment. You can go meet with your family life consultant. Um, and those roles include social workers. They also I believe have some that are LPCs too. So different disciplines can fulfill those roles. Um, the contract and travel assignments. So there are companies that do contract with military bases to provide civilian services um, for an extended time. So say for example, you, you're assigned to a base and your contract is for two or three years. Then that, and and that's not only in the U.S. That's overseas at the uh, bases overseas also. So um, that role is slightly different, and you'll be actually working um, as a medical social worker or a social worker in an outpatient clinic, or just really just whatever the need is. But those assignments are uh, longer than just like the family life consultants. And then they do have to chart when you're doing the travel assignments and the contract assignments and you're actually working in like a hospital, then you do have to keep up with the medical record charting and, and things of that nature. And then uh, the outpatient mental health clinic. So our outpatient mental health clinic um, on the basis that um, I was stationed at, it was traditional mental health clinic. It also included uh, the sex not the sexual assault, sorry, the substance abuse component, and then also the family advocacy. So uh, if you look here on the screen, the outpatient mental health clinic, family advocacy, and ADAP, it was alcohol, drug abuse, prevention, and treatment. All three of these agencies fell under one mental health clinic. And what we would do, I was in a technician role at the time, we would rotate through. So I was able to get experience in all three uh, areas of the clinic. Um, when I joined the military, I had a bachelor's in social work. I'm sorry, a bachelor's in psychology. And then I went on to get my master's in social work. And I was able to do some of my um, field practicum internship actually in my office where I work, which was really nice. Um, it just saved so much time for me to be able to be at work and just kind of separate and, and do my internship also. So um, inpatient mental health settings, um, the social workers do have roles in those as well, providing inpatient services to um, service members and their families. Now, one of our roles as a mental health technician, we actually were deployed to the inpatient mental health facility overseas. Um, during the time that I was in, not sure how much has changed now, there was one inpatient mental health facility overseas, and it was in Longstuhl, Germany. Um, so that one inpatient unit serviced every military base that was overseas and also the deployed settings. 
one of the interesting parts of my role while being a technician on that unit, I was there for seven months. Uh, one of the most interesting parts is, say, for example, we had a service members um, who were not deemed safe enough to return back to a deployed location. So they would receive orders that they would have to go back to their home base uh, here in the U.S. So as uh, mental health technicians, we had the pleasure of escorting them from Germany back to the United States, wherever their base was. So for example, uh, they would come from their deployed location to our facility, our inpatient unit in Germany. Um, they would stay there for about a week or so, depending on what the needs were. And then they would have to wait to be processed um, to get on the flight manifest to make sure they're cleared medically, make sure they're cleared mental health wise. Um, to be able to be transported back to the U.S. So we would leave Germany on a military plane. Um, and it was, and I'm forgive me, I'm bad with the military plane uh, names, but it was the really, really, really big one that is just hollow in the middle. Patriot so, Express. <laughs> say that again? Was it Patriot Express? I, I, I the way my memory is set up, I have no, I can't remember, <laughs> but... It was a really big plane. There was just nets on the side of the walls that we sat on. And then in the middle of the um, plane was just like bunk beds. So there were like three bunk beds stacked for the patients who were non-ambulatory. So if you were ambulatory, you were strapped uh, in the cargo net seat on the walls of the plane. And then if you were not uh, ambulatory, you were stacked in one of the three beds. Good times, good times. So for the most part, so I'll say this, uh, I was in Germany for seven months. I flew back to the U.S. seven times in those seven months, uh, seven times. And we would leave Germany and fly to Bethesda, Maryland. So that was about nine hours. And then we would spend the night there um, at one of the, of the hospitals. Um, still like an inpatient setting at their hospital. So then we would spend the night there. And then the next morning, depending on where your base is, will determine where your next plane was going. So if you had a base that was kind of on the East Coast, then you probably had a shorter flight from Maryland to, you know, uh, like a lot of Army bases are down in Georgia or in the Carolinas or something like that. Or Virginia area. So super close. Now, if you were going to like the Midwest, the Texas, uh, those areas, then you would get on a plane headed to the Midwest. Uh, now, if you were going out, because, you know, there's a lot of bases out in like Hawaii and California. So depending on where you're going would determine how many more planes you had to get on. So you leave Germany, spend the night in Maryland, then get up and fly to the Midwest, spend the night or go straight to California, spend the night there, and then fly over to Hawaii if that's where you're going. So it was it was a lot. It was a lot of flying, um, a lot of back and forth. Um, but it, it also at the same time, it was a great experience, of course, because you got to see um, the ins and outs of inpatient mental health uh, when it comes to service members. And then also with that inpatient unit being the only inpatient unit overseas, family members and dependents were able to be serviced there as well. I didn't see a lot of family members and dependents, um, but it was open to them. And then also with that inpatient unit, um, it wasn't just, it was all branches. Um, all branches of the military were serviced there and then all branches of the military were workers. Um, so say, for example, the mental health technicians from the Army and the Navy. At the time, the Marines didn't have mental health techs. So it was just the Air Force, Army, and the Navy that had mental health staff members that were working, along with the uh, civilian personnel that worked overseas as well. And I was going to say something else about that. Um, a part of our training, um, when I was active duty, 
uh, our mental health training was 13 weeks and it was at a base in Wichita Falls, Texas. It's North Texas. And um, since I've separated, well, yeah, since I've separated, um, now they have a, a considered like a joint mental health training where uh, the Navy, the uh, Air Force and the Army, all their mental health staff technicians go through the same training course together, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. They didn't have that when I was in, which is okay. Okay, so he talked about that. So family advocacy. Uh, family advocacy basically serviced all the family needs within the military. And um, I know each branch of the military may have different names for their programs, um, but a lot of the references that I make are going to be Air Force because that's dear to my heart, right? So family advocacy, we dealt with um, the sexual abuse, physical abuse of children and minors, especially if they lived in base housing. Um, also, they dealt with uh, family counseling, uh, couples therapy, um, anything related to family issues, it went through family advocacy. Say, for example, if you um, live on base and your dependent child, 15 year old or something like that, got caught stealing at a um, at the BX, which is the, the where we shop on on base. It's like a Walmart for bases. Um, so if say if a dependent of yours got caught stealing on base, then you get referred to family advocacy to deal with the family uh, repercussions of that and see what is going to be like the next step kind of situation. Um, and then ADAP, like I said, is the Alcohol, Drug Abuse and Prevention Treatment Program. Um, so uh, service members are not immune to or exempt from any regular issues that uh, a civilians deal with. So there were a lot of drug and alcohol issues and concerns among uh, service members. Now, I'll give you an example of how that program worked. So say, for example, you and your friends are out, you are all young airmen, you're out, um, you're old enough to drink, of course, um, but you decide to drive home. Um, you get pulled over and then, you know, your blood alcohol level is above what it's supposed to be. You're not supposed to be driving home. So then what will happen is, um, and this is not on base, by the way, if you're just out in the community. So the local police uh, will notify the base because, of course, when they take you in and arrest you and do your fingerprints, you're going to show up as a military member. So the local police will notify the base, hey, we have um, Airman Graves here. Um, and, you know, they are arrested for DUI, DWI, anything like that. And then your first sergeant will be the person um, that will come and get you out of jail. And uh, it's not, not a place that you want to be, of course. You don't want to have your first sergeant ever get called about something that you did. So what happens then, and um, the your unit, your first sergeant, your commander, your supervisor, anyone in your leadership chain of command, they would make a referral to the ADAP program and just say, hey, we have a person, they got a DUI over the weekend um, and we're referring them to your program. What our program did was we would take those referrals, we would do intake assessments. And as a technician, we did a lot of intake assess assessments and triages um, and family advocacy, regular mental health, and then the substance abuse clinic too. So we would do that assessment and we would determine if you need to be enrolled in a treatment program or if you just need to be enrolled into some education classes to learn how to make better decisions when it comes to uh, drinking and, and being out. Um, so for example, you know, if you go through your assessment and, you know, it's a first time thing um, or your, your BAC wasn't insanely high. It might just have been a little bit over uh, where you shouldn't have been driving, but it still wasn't just like, oh my gosh, um, insane. You know, we may say, okay, you would benefit from two or three educational courses about alcohol. 
And in those educational classes, we would just go over the the stands, standards of, you know, how does alcohol affect us um, when we are out, when we're drinking? How much does one drink raise your, your, uh, your BAC? How long does it take alcohol to leave your system? So all of these things were incorporated in that educational program. Um, and the most interesting thing to me, uh, when we used to do assessments, we would ask them, um, so, you know, how much did you drink on the night of the, the incident? And, you know, people say, oh, I only had one drink, right? So then, you know, we would go, okay, are we talking one drink red solo cup? Or are we talking like the Taco Bell guzzler? Uh, like, what are we talking about? What, what's your one drink stipulation? So then, you know, we kind of get to the bottom of it or people say, oh, I only had two beers, but then they'll forget to tell you that the two beers were like the big 24 ounces and you had them back to back. Right. So we go into more of the what does the drinking look like for you type of situation. Um, that way we can decide. Now, we have had um, service members who needed uh, like detox treatment. Um, inpatient substance use treatment, and we coordinate that as well and, and get them off to treatment. And the same thing with um, inpatient mental health. So if they present as a danger to themselves or others, um, we would use community agencies, um, inpatient units um, to send them there, let them do their treatment, um, and then when they discharge out of that treatment, then they just continue to follow up with the outpatient clinics. So let's see. Yep. So that, that was ADAP. Um, sexual assault prevention and response program. That program, if you're ever around military lingo, acronyms will fly across the board everywhere, right? So um, that one is called the SARC. So if you ever hear the word SARC, they're talking about sexual assault and prevention. Um, so um, the, like the program managers can be civilian social workers, um, and their role is to manage that sexual assault prevention program. Um, a lot of things related to the military, there's a lot of briefings and trainings. Um, so a part of our job as technicians was to go out and talk to like the new uh, airmen that were coming on base to kind of give them the services of what mental health offers. Um, what to kind of look for, what to kind of expect when they are transitioning to, you know, active duty life from, you know, just leaving home, um, just giving them more education, more things to look out for. Also, other briefings and presentations we would do were related to deployments, uh, what to kind of expect when you deploy, and then some resiliency training when they return on what to expect. Um, as well. Another role that social workers play is participating in some of those briefings to let not only service members, but we also had briefings for family members to kind of give them some ideas of what they can expect when their loved one comes back home. Um, some things to look out for related to mental health or substance use or anything like that. So those are some of the roles that uh, social workers do feel when it comes to um, Social work. Okay. How do I become a military social worker? Um, so as you heard, my MSW had a specialty concentration in military social work. So, you know, if you are a BSW student and you're um, wanting to move on, because I know it, you're going to want to move on and get your MSW and then get your clinical license um, and all those fun things, you can look into schools that are First of all, they have to be accredited, right? So make sure your school is accredited and look at the degrees that they offer with the concentration uh, subspecialties that they offer as well. There are a lot of different things you can specialize in when it comes to the social work degree. Uh, my master's, I con my concentration was military social work, but with my doctorate, my um, focus was more on clinical expertise, um, but there are a lot of different options you can choose when it comes to, of course, schools, what degrees, what concentrations you want to um, focus on. And then um, certifications. Um, I have the uh, board certification from the American Board of Clinical Social Work. There are a lot of different certifications that 
um, social workers get, whether it be financial, um, social work. There's also some certifications related to like sports, of course, the military, social work. It really just depends on which direction you want to go in. Um, the CEU courses, you can find those any and everywhere. I always encourage you to try to find the free ones first because they can get a little pricey. Um, and then also, since you guys are students, you can find uh, student rates um, and then student discount um, CEUs. And I always, excuse me, encourage my students to, you know, when it's time for like the NASW conference, or it might be uh, either the national or the local one, you know, look for the opportunity to volunteer as a student, and then you get a heavy discount on registration, and then you'll still be able to participate and get some CEUs, and you get the experience in being a part of a conference, and then networking uh, also ties in, into that as well. So, you know, you can look into CEU trainings that specialize in um, everything, basically. So, of course, ethics is going to be a big one. Um, you have to have so many of those CEUs, um, you know, when it's time to renew your license and things like that. I always encourage students to whatever state you're in, start looking at your state licensure board just to see what those requirements are and get familiar with that. So that way, you know how many CEUs you need and uh, kind of what's expected of you to continue on when you when you want to maintain that license. And networking, I'm a huge supporter of networking. I created a whole PowerPoint presentation on how to network as a social worker. Um, it's just the best thing uh, that you need to do. Um, even if you're a little hesitant, you may not be a, a sociable, outgoing person, but there are other ways to uh, network and make sure that you're getting the information and knowledge that you may not otherwise be exposed to. Um, without meeting people who are in different areas and in different arenas and have that experience also. But I won't go into too much about networking. I'm saving it for my networking presentation in the spring. Okay, so here are some examples of uh, resources that are available. I'm going to pause this one real quick and pull up the Military One Source website, just so you can see, where is it, what it offers. Can you all see that? Okay, I'm assuming yes. Okay, so when you go, this is a website that I refer uh, a lot of people to, whether it be active duty members or veterans. Um, and for example, you can look down here and just see, these are all the different topics um that are shown right so then you know say for example if it's deployment related so how to prepare for deployment during deployment and returning home and like i mentioned a part of mental health's job in the military is to talk about some of these um things that are that are going on um on the air force base there is a we uh call it the airman and family readiness center um and Every base has a different name for it, but it basically is like the resource hub for uh, active duty service members and their families. Say, for example, if you need assistance with um, PCS and moving, you know, they can uh, get you like all the information related to a checklist, connect you with the housing department to make sure you're prepared to uh, properly leave your home on base and get set up with housing. Um, at your new station, say, for example, if you're a, a new young couple just, you know, joining the military um, and you're getting ready to move out of the dorms, but you may not have um, enough money to pay like a security deposit for your apartment, um, you know, sometimes if they want like a couple months up in advance or a month or something, um, or if you need help with um, just some basic household goods. Um, our Airmen and Family Readiness Center, uh, they offered a, I want to say like a little thrift shop on base. So if you ever think about when military families move um, or just when, if you've ever moved and then you're at the point where you're like, you know what, I am over this packing, I'm over everything, I don't even care, 
going to give all this stuff away and I'm going to just start over when I get there. So a lot of people do that when you're frustrated with packing and you're just kind of over it. They give a lot of things away to like the thrift shop on base. So, you know, young airmen or people who are just moving into a home or something like that, they can go on base and shop um, in the thrift shop for just little things that can be helpful. So that the military uh, one source website is, oops, I did the wrong slide. Hold on a second. Is a great resource for um, that we send a lot of people. And then the Airman Family Readiness Center is the center that I was talking about. Now, when I was transitioning out of the military, uh, the Airman and Family Readiness Center provided a training and it's called Transitional Assistance um, Course. So it was like a week long situation where we would go in and uh, meet with uh, representatives from like finance so they can explain to you how you're going to transition financially from receiving your military money to, okay, now I have to pay for my own insurance. Now I have to pay for all these things that were covered while I was active duty that won't be covered anymore. So we also had um, a person that came from like the Department of Veteran Affairs to talk about how to set up your medical care um, and to set up if you're even eligible for medical uh, assistance. So uh, Veterans Affairs, fun fact, uh, active duty members have to serve at least two years, right? And it's a lot of different stipulations on whether a person is eligible for health care. Now, health care is separate from just benefits. Benefits is related to like um, the GI Bill, the the home loan, the, the college assistance for your spouses and kids and things like that. The health care is just for the service member slash veteran, right? So what will happen is once uh, service members transition out of their active duty role, they'll go to the VA um, and present them with their DD-214 and the VA will verify their service and see if they're eligible for health care. So some of the things that make you ineligible for healthcare with the VA relate to like your discharge status. So if you had a dishonorable discharge, your services are very limited. Um, if you have, uh, say for example, if you were reserve duty and you know you just did your one week in a month, two weeks a year situation, but you never were called up on active duty orders to fulfill a um, an extended role or something like that. You may not be eligible for health care depending on how much time you actually serve on active duty orders compared to just your traditional standard of reserve time, if that makes any sense. The, the most important thing, you know, when you're working with service members as a military social worker is having them prepared to separate. Um, whether that be a person that's retiring after 20 plus years or a person that is maybe getting kicked out of the military for doing some some violations of some things or a person that's just say, hey, you know, I did my four years um, and I had enough, so I'm ready to get out. So um, a lot of it is knowing what to provide to them as far as their resources and support. So the Department of Veteran Affairs came and presented during our um, our transition uh, course. So that was very helpful. There was also another person that came and talked about how to create a federal resume because a lot of people who were in the military, um, you know, they get offered contract jobs on base or they want to come work at the VA or they want to work for another federal agency then we had a person that was there to help us uh, create a federal resume as compared to just a traditional civilian resume. And, you know, social workers can help work with them on how to compute their military service time and their role into a civilian um, resume so it can be understood. Because the, you know, everything we did in the military was acronyms and it's specialized um, and only military people know it, right? Unless you're just like super, super knowledgeable about military stuff. 
But when you present all of that to a civilian person, they'd be like, I, I don't know what any of this means. Um, so one of the resources, you know, the social workers can help uh, transcribe all of your military stuff into civilian wording and making sure that um, it presents very well. Uh, TRICARE is the uh, insurance provider for service members. Um, now, service members and their families can be seen on base, right? If the, the care allows and the space allows and things like that. For the Department of Veteran Affairs, only the veteran is able to be seen. Now, also when people separate, you know, if you retire, then you have like that TRICARE for life thing or whatever it's called, uh, but you're able to be seen in, uh, in the community or on a base. Um, so I'm here in the Houston area. There's no active duty base here in Houston. There is a reserve or guard base, uh, probably about 40 minutes east of me. Um, so there, it, depending on what city you're in, if you're able to be seen on base or if you'll be seen in the community or if you'll be seen by the Department of Veteran Affairs. Um, other resources, the Veterans Crisis Line. Um, and the Veterans Crisis Line is basically the National Suicide Prevention Line. You just press, uh, excuse me, you just press one to go for Veterans Crisis Line. And what happens with that? So say for example, um, and this is active duty, uh, guard, reserve, family members, anyone can call the crisis line. So say for example, if if I called on behalf of my spouse who is uh, active, um, a veteran, right? So I say, hey, you know, I'm really worried about my husband. You know, he has increased drinking and he's going through all these things. How do I get him connected for help? So then what the crisis line will do is get your location and they will route a consult to your local VA. So um, when I used to do suicide prevention, that was a part of our role was, um, answering those calls or answering those consults that we got from the, the crisis line. So then we would reach out to the veteran locally and say, hey, you know, I'm with the Houston VA. Uh, we got notification that you wanted to get connected. How can we help get you connected with services in the community or at the VA? Um, other resources, conferences and training. There are a lot of, of mental health related conferences and training related to um, military social work, they have like annual suicide prevention, annual military trainings and conferences that you can attend. And again, uh, use those student benefits and, and try to get those discounted rates um, and, you know, save money wherever you can and attend those conferences and trainings just to see, you know, what is changing, um, what's new, what, how can you help if you want to get involved that way. And then also you have the sexual assault safety helpline, and it's very similar to the veterans crisis line as well. Um, it's just another way that they can get you connected with the sexual assault response team um, on base or in the community with some resources also. Okay, any questions? Oh wait, let me get back to my other screen. Are you back with us? <laughs> yes, I'm back. Can you see me? I'm like, I yes. just, I just closed yeah. down like five different windows. Okay. Absolutely. That was such a good um, presentation. I'm going to let everyone else ask questions if they have okay. any. Yeah, have. yeah, yeah, go ahead. That was so good. And guys, don't be afraid. You can um, chime in in the chat and I'll read the question out loud or you could raise it. All right, Laura. I see your hand. You can feel free to unmute and ask your question. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation and thank you for your service. Um, my, my question is, I once licensed, I'd like to work with the organization Give an Hour. Okay. Um, but as someone who's never been part of the military, how do you bridge that gap? and show that empathy because in essence, I might not be able to understand 
what someone has gone through in their military experience. But as a therapist, how do, how do you bridge that gap? And it really does come down to leaning into that, you know, I really want to know and understand more. Can you tell me a little bit more about X, Y, and Z? Um, I always encourage people to do a little more research about what um, area or even just the basics of military when it comes to like deployments and um, just like, and like I mentioned before, a lot of people are just dealing with regular life stressors. So even if you may not grasp specifically what they're talking about uh, related to their job, that you can catch the overall arch theme of I have work stress and how do I fix this? How do I adjust it? And building that report, when you're building that report with them, um, just leaning in to say, you know, I really want to understand more about the stress that you're you're getting from work. Can you tell me what comes along with your job? What 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 do you have to do? What what part and what role do you play, you know, in your job? And just um because a lot of times I meet with veterans and they they want to know that you're a veteran um, before they'll kind of let their guard down sometimes. And even um, if, even when I'm a veteran, but I was medical. So even for me, people would be like, oh, you were just in the hospital. You didn't really work in the Air Force. Like I would get that. So I'd be like, wait a minute, what do you mean? Like, so that's when I say, okay, help me understand because I really do want to help you. That's why I'm here to help. So um, are you comfortable with sharing a little bit more about what your job entails, what your role is for, for your work? Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Alexis, you're next. Alexis, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. I was trying to chew my food. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm a veteran of the army for six years. Um, my, so my focus is on, like you touched on homelessness. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to be able to like create a company that I can build tiny homes for them. Not okay. just necessarily like homelessness for veterans, but like just like homelessness in general. Right, gotcha. One of the things that I always um, encourage people when they have those great ideas of what they wanna do and how they wanna contribute um, to start researching what's already out there and that way it'll give you more insight into, okay, this is how this goes. This is, look, this is what it looks like. And then that's where that networking component comes in to see, you know, how can I touch bases with someone, whether it be a developer or someone that's on project management within that company that does this just to kind of pick their brain. Um, and then you can look to see even if it's something like, so let me tell you how my, my mind works. I'm like, ooh, I can call the bank and ask them, hey, let me just pick your brain about questions about financing for this or what programs are eligible uh, you know, for this. Like say, for example, if you'll be a new business owner, okay, what type of new business owner information can I get? And then okay. my mind just spins like off of that. And then I'm like, oh, okay, let me call this developing company. I, I saw their name on a, a little tiny home uh, or container home. I've seen those kind of pop up. And then you can, <laughs> in the background. That's my so son. Funny. Yeah, that's my son. Yep. That's too yep. cute. And um, I I would just definitely, I, I'm a fan of Google and just research to see, you know, tiny veteran homes and then kind of read up on what new projects are coming in the area or what new projects are, are out there across and then see if you can go to like that developer's website because they'll say, hey, we have new tiny homes coming by Graves uh, Foundation. Then you go to the Graves Foundation website and see, read about that. See who you can connect with to say, hey, pick your brain. Let me pick your brain. Yeah, because I know that there's like, I live in Hinesville, Georgia. 
and there's a homeless net, uh, homeless, um, I forgot what the name of it is called off the top of my head in Savannah. Mm -hmm. Um, and <clears throat> I had recently went to a workshop where I had talked to an actual veteran who she actually goes overseas and builds like schools, houses and oh, wow. everything for that. Um, for them over there. So she had mentioned like reaching out to them mm -hmm. um, to like get my foot in the door type of thing. Like if that makes sense, like, absolutely, you know, introducing myself and saying, hey, you know, this is what I'm looking into doing like, you know, um, that's yeah, but like, that's my when I went into social work, like, this is my second master's. So, mm -hmm. like, that's being a veteran, like, that's, like, what touches my heart. Mm -hmm. And also, mm -hmm. like, I know they they have the classes for transitioning. But mm -hmm. when I was transitioning, um, I had retirees I had people who were just getting out and then mm -hmm. I had like med boarded people which mm -hmm. was me so like half of the class didn't pertain to half of the people yeah right that and that's the one kind of like ugh, part of those transition classes it's like a catch-all because I yeah. was in class with people who were like I don't, I'll just get a job. I don't need this. I'm gonna just get a job. And it's like, right. no, it's not as easy as I'm just going to get a job. Like, yeah, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> so they so like, I wanted off. to, I wanted to be able to like, um, provide or be able to like create like the classes that the specific people needed, you know, like the retirees, like that, that's different right. than the med board people and that's different than just the people getting out like like to make sure that they have the classes that they need and can understand hey this is what you need to do this is you know like like that's my main focus but mm -hmm. both of them both of them like getting the classes that they need while transitioning mm -hmm. because I have already been through it mm -hmm. And then, right. you know, like having the help, you know, if, hey, like my bills aren't going to pay my rent, like how am I going to have a house? Right. Yeah. You know, like, and am I going to be homeless or, you know, like, like that's like going through this program, it, that's like my main focus. Mm-hmm. And it's and not just necessarily people. the veterans, but like, it's just like the homeless people in general. And it's so many different needs. Um, and it's great that, you know, you have that, that lens of, okay, I see this need. How do I figure out how to bridge that gap and make sure that everyone's needs are getting met? You know, whether that be you say, for example, if you have a active duty base that's in your area, or yeah, I do. To... It, it's literally like five minutes away. <laughs> cool. And then, you know, something you can do is maybe reach out to uh, like the Airman Family Readiness Center to connect with them to pick their brains on, you know, how their transition class is offered and see how maybe you can come in as a veteran and offer additional support or, hey, I, you know, have these great ideas for retirees, you know, um, how right. can I collab with you guys or how can I, you know, uh, help out? And then that's where the advocacy comes in. Yes. The wonderful part of social work. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I just like, that's, that's, that's my yeah, drive. I know. Like as, that's as my long drive. As you keep having that drive is going to be great. So I just always say, just keep reaching out to like the resource centers 
um, reaching out to different social workers or different civilians who kind of um, handle some of those programs to see, you know, what else can be added. Um, okay. And helpful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I have a question from the chat. Um, from yeah. Doc. Tanisha, it says, how can a civilian start the path in mil start the path in military social work? Do you automatically jump into applying at the VA? So that is a great question. And it really depends on where you want to go. Because like I mentioned, you can do it at the VA. You can do it at um, active duty bases. You can do it at reserve bases. You can, um, it completely just fell right out of my head. Oh, we have uh, like the Department of Veteran Affairs. We have vet centers. Um, so they're, a little more laid back than just a traditional mental health clinic. So the the um, the big picture answer is usajobs.gov is the website where all the federal jobs will be, right? So, <laughs> um, and that's where I talked about having a federal resume versus just a civilian resume um, is important for that. But even if you just go on USA Jobs and type in social work, and just see what jobs come up. That way you can get more familiar with jobs that are on bases, jobs that are um, um, not on bases, like at the VA. So another website, let me pull it up so I'm not lying to you guys, but I know it's, and I told you I'm biased towards the Air Force, so you have to forgive me, but it's like, uh, it's an Air Force civilians job website. So that way it'll show you all the bases. Oh, I found it. I'm going to post it in the chat. And you can go on there. That's where uh, civilians can go and work. And this is where I found the information about the True North program. So you can uh, look on their website and see um, what type of Air Force civilian employment is, is out there for you. And then there is uh, on USA Jobs there. Once you go in and set up an account, there is a way you can go in and build a resume. And then there's also a where you can just go in and upload your own resume. And when I talk about networking, one of the most important things you can do. Um, I know if you're not a social media person, don't don't beat me up. But on Facebook, there is a government social workers group on Facebook. You could join that group and start talking to people, start uh, connecting with people, start reading through um, and seeing what else is going on. So there is a military social work group on Facebook, and then there's a federal employee social worker group or something to that effect. Um, a lot of times, uh, certain VAs will have direct hiring positions where they'll say, hey, guys, we got to open it in our unit or we got an opening in the clinic, do you know a social worker that uh, you can refer? And I can be like, heck yeah, I know somebody, let me send you the resume. Um, so, and then you can skip the whole USAA part, right? You'll just go right into a direct hire. Um, also check with your local VAs, like if they have a Facebook page, uh, and make sure you follow them. A lot of times they will post, we're having hiring fairs. I've met a lot of social workers that got hired on the spot at a local VA from a hiring fair. And they'll, the VA will be like, hey, we're having a hiring fair. Bring your resume, bring your ID, bring, you know, bring your stuff, come dress. They're doing interviews on the spot. They're hiring on the spot kind of thing. So it's possible. Thank you. And someone did mention the same thing. They wanted to know, how do you, do you have any recommendations? And I think you just provided some great ones, but I will say this, and I, I try to explain this to social workers from a non-social work lens, because I'm not a micro social worker, but I know when I lived overseas in Germany, a lot of individuals came over for the two to three year contract as social workers. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're always looking for social workers to work in behavioral health and to work at FAP. And even in the fine, like if you want to do non-clinical stuff to work like with mm -hmm. our financial departments for FAP, they're always looking in the Red Cross. Like it, don't sleep on the Red Cross overseas because they will house you on a base and you'll be a military. Mm -hmm. 
And also, um, I'm glad you mentioned that. So when I talk about networking, I'm telling you, I love networking. So there's also a Facebook group called Traveling Social Workers. And people are going there and they'll post like, hey, we got a contract. Anybody trying to go here? And then you can find out more information about the agencies that offer those contract positions. Like if you're in a position now where you are like single, no kids, and you can move about and, you know, get your feet wet and do some things. Um, or, you know, if you got a spouse that works from home and you homeschool the kids and you guys can pop around, you know, look into some of those traveling social work jobs. Some you can be, um, I've seen people talk about doing some and they don't even have their, they're not even licensed at the master's level. Um, and I've seen people do some license at the master's level. Of course, you get more if you're licensed at the clinical level um, and things of that nature. So it's a lot of different ways and opportunities you can kind of get your foot in the door and get that experience and get more um, knowledge about that. Um, Casey, to I thought answer. I saw somebody about housing or working with homeless veterans. Oh, yeah. Alexis, I think asked that earlier. Oh, okay. Okay. Casey, to answer your question really quickly, and then I'll let Dr. Tanisha answer if she has more expertise on this area. I'm just speaking from the lens of a spouse um, and a social worker. So when I was in school for social work, a lot of my placements were macro-based at um, my duty station in Germany. So there are macro level jobs. They just probably won't say things like social work. They'll probably say like policy, policy assistant. Um, they'll probably say program developer. They'll probably say um, like SFRG consult consultant. And that's basically the person that works with the um, single soldiers family um, and married soldiers, or it'll be like boss life. Um, advocate, which works with single soldiers. So there are macro opportunities, but I don't think that they will be just mentioned as social works. You'll, you'll have to be um, a little, um, what's that word I'm thinking of? You'll have to be creative with what you put in USA mm -hmm. jobs, USA jobs, but there are a lot of policy level jobs that they hire social workers for. Absolutely. And even when you're looking on Indeed, um, you know, play around with the verbiage and don't just put social worker. You can put like LMSW because a lot of jobs will require you to have your master's in social work or something like that. But it just doesn't say, hey, this is a social work job. So a lot of things uh, when I'm looking around on USA jobs and I'm like, I want to get out of just clinical social work, then you can put in stuff like program specialist, program manager, analyst. Um, it's a all of the kind of social services type jobs. Um, you can do social services, a search for that versus just social worker. Uh, Cause a lot of the VA jobs are geared to kind of that traditional social work, but there are a lot of social workers who don't work in those traditional clinical roles. Um, also the website I posted about the Air Force civilian careers, they have some uh, like specialist jobs or prevention advocacy type jobs that are not direct clinical practice. So it's like you really kind of just got to play around with the, the words when you're doing your search and then you can start to see. And then also being in those groups and just starting to network and connect with other people and pick their brain. Uh, to see how they got a non-clinical type social work job. We have another question in the chat. It says, are there any job titles that combine military social work with a nursing background? I do have an idea. I do have something to share, but I'm going to let Dr. Tanisha share first, and then I'll tell you <laughs> what I've seen. That, and that's another thing. It's just like playing around with the titles just to kind of see uh, what's out there. Because um, a, a lot of people kind of cross train with the, I've met, uh, I'll say this, a lot of my students at Walden come from like that CNA background or LP, is it LPN or LVN or, or something to that effect, the, the nursing realm. And they have those backgrounds. So it's like, you know, big picture, where do you want to go? Um, and look into it that way. But it really is playing with the job titles just to see, um, you know, what you're looking for. Um, so Erica, my response for that was going to be um, 
I I'm, I can only speak from the army lens because you know I'm an army wife. Um, <laughs> but for me, I actually did encounter someone who had um, both of those degrees. So they went from a BSN to an MS, a MSW. And she was actually the person who recommended me to come into the profession. And her role on our base in Germany was parent support. So she basically did the, she worked under FAP, which is the family advocacy program, but she was parent support. So all she did was like house visits for parents with newborn babies and put on like parent boot camps. So more of like the community organizing aspect of social work. And she used her nursing degree to benefit her because she knew a lot about breastfeeding and um, postpartum depression. So it was able to it was able to be a a win win for her. But I think when it comes to military jobs, from what I've seen, if you are trying to step outside of like clinical stuff, there's so much opportunity. Like even if you work at like an education center as a social worker on a base that gives you an opportunity to service like service members that are going back to school and trying to get their degree mm -hmm. or trying to increase their, um, is it called GR, GR? I don't know. Whatever score you need to get a job in the military to trying to increase their job, um, their <laughs> yeah. score so they can swap jobs. So there's so much things that you can do. Like my husband, he does retention. He did, he has done retention in the past. And that's kind of like he works hand in hand with like social workers to make sure that people stay in the military. So there's so mm -hmm. many things that you can do. And vocational rehab is another big one too. I see a lot of people who want to go into some vocational rehab and, and work with uh, service members. Any other questions? I can ramble for days. <laughs> We are almost at our time. So if you guys have questions, it is a great opportunity to get it. But I think as students or, you know, social workers that are already in the profession, if you're thinking about joining or like transitioning to military social work, I always tell people when they ask me how to do that or like, what's the benefit? It's just consider, think of it like if you were working with someone um, from another ethnic group and you would have to get culturally aware of what is happening mm -hmm. and what's um, particular to that cultural um, demographic or if you're working with someone with a diagnosis that you're not familiar with right it's the same thing when it comes to military social work familiarizing yourself with the culture of the military um, flow so that you're prepared for some of the stuff that comes with it James I saw your hand you can unmute, unless if it was an accident. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, I just wanted to add um, for you guys that are asking this question. Um, I'm a military veteran myself. Um, I just started working at the B as a social worker. And uh, I can definitely tell you, like, having that military experience has given me an advantage because for my first day, um, I was pretty much able to relate um, you know, to a lot of the veterans and, and you know, being able to help them out. So um, I would say that if you're looking into coming to this profession, um, just like Dr. Tanisha said, and, you know, Risa said, like, you know, just do your research, network, um, but it, it is a rewarding career. And there's like, there's so many ways that you can go about doing it. I mean, I, I literally just started about 30 days ago, and I'm already seeing like, there's so many ways that, you know, that I can go with this. So it, it's a very rewarding career, um, you know, that much I can say, but um, definitely coming in with the knowledge of knowing how to relate um, with the veterans is definitely going to help you out a lot. James, thank you Absolutely. so much for doing this. Thank you to, for your service for everyone that has served that is on this um, Zoom tonight. And for those that are going to watch the replay tomorrow, thank you so much for your service. And um, I tip my hats off to, you know, the, the the combat boots and the OCPs. So thank you for your service. Oh, you know, I just thought about something uh, I forgot to mention earlier. Even if you're in a position where you want to um, now, say, for example, you have your MSW and you want to go active duty and be a social worker, there are programs where they can, if you, I'm Air Force biased again. So, and I know the Army has it too. But 
you can apply to be a part of your uh, be a part of their program where they'll provide that clinical supervision for you and you'll get all of your clinical hours and then you know pass your test and then now your LCSW um, active duty social worker as an officer and you'll work in some of those arenas that I mentioned the, the family advocacy the substance abuse the mental health clinic um, things like that. So there are different ways, whether you want to stay civilian and work with military or whether you want to be a um, active duty social worker. And yes, bonuses and benefits pay off some of those student loans, all the, the wonderful things that, you know, can be afforded to you if you do choose uh, to do that. And a lot of times I've seen people say, for example, if they took one of the contract jobs, um, you know, and start networking and getting to know some people. And then once a government job came about, then it's like, boom, I already know somebody. I can plug them right in because, you know, you know somebody. That's the beautiful part of the network. Yes. A recruiter actually sent me a, a message, like, I think a month after I graduated from my MSW. I don't know how they found me. And they were like, yes. if you want to work for behavioral health, we'll give you, I think it was like $90,000 as a sign-on bonus. I was like, I can't. We can't be a dual yeah. military. I always say if they want you bad enough, they'll they'll move some mountains and, and make the money big enough. You have to figure out if it's worth it though. So thank you so much, Dr. Tanisha. You're I welcome. You for literally coming and providing us with so much insight from your lived experience, as well as from just your expertise of working with military veterans and working on the base. I think it's a unique mm -hmm. experience, especially if you are not familiar with um, my great grandfather will be 112 years old in January and a W. Oh, oh wow. Oh, thank you. That's awesome. Give him a hug for me. He's like Please. a national treasure. I love our um, older veterans. And tell him welcome home and he'll know what that means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but thank you so much for the, just this opportunity just to give so much knowledge to the participants. As I said in the chat, if I'm able to get the presentation and create and turn it into a PDF for those few slides for you guys, I will do so. But Dr. Tanisha gave you guys her contacts. So I hope you guys took it down. If not, I will send it out in the recap video Friday, I believe. I'll send an email with that information so you guys can get in contact with her if you guys have further questions and if you just want to know how to navigate the space of networking, mm -hmm. getting into um, military social work. It is rewarding. I could say firsthand as a, as a social worker, one, but also as a military spouse that I see the benefit of individuals working with families um, and service members on a day-to-day -day basis. So happy Veterans Day to everyone on the live and everyone watching the recording. Thank you for your service. And for everyone else, thank you for joining us tonight. And we will see you at our next student program. Bye. Nice meeting y'all. Have a good one.